Super Bowl Central. On the Channel 5 Morning News. Are you unlucky at love? This is my second divorce. How can you keep love alive? Doing dishes is great foreplay for great sex. We're gonna go from relationship hell to relationship heaven. Talking about sex. On the next... Patch it. Oh, how to be a better husband. I don't need that one. How to be a better girlfriend. No, I don't need that one. I need, uh, oh, 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 I got it. What your mother couldn't tell you and your father didn't know, the new bestseller by John Gray. And he's here. The doctor is in the house on pageant. <laughs> Wait with us. We're going to take a poll. You have stopped clapping. Now I want to hear you clap if you have had relationship help. She nags, he doesn't listen. Nobody, everyone's just happy as can be. You have had help. Yes, we know you have. I have. Today, we have with us a best-selling author. His last book was entitled, or no, it wasn't your last book, but your mega, mega book. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. The doctor is with us today. Yay! We're happy! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. He's gonna help us out today. Before we talk to the doc, I would like to introduce Kelly and Scott. They are brother and sister, and uh, they have had it with relationship problems, and they're here to talk about maybe what the cause is. Please welcome them to our show. Can you tell me, Kelly, your divorce? For five years. For five years. And you've been divorced once? This is my second divorce. Okay. And Scott, you are currently seeking a divorce, is that correct? Yeah. I uh, haven't gone through the legal motions yet, but have filled out uh, quite a few papers. Okay. Can you, can you tell us, Kelly, w what the problem has been so far with your relationships? I seem to be attracting um, men with strong addictions of all sorts. Drugs, sex, rock and roll? Everything. And Name it, it's been there. Do, who do, you, do you blame somebody for that? Not knowing how to discern whether somebody has problems, issues of their own to work through. Um, and most of the time I like to blame it on this facade that they put out, this aura, this charm, and then getting attracted to it. And like, like the little mouse with the snake, you know, doesn't know it's about to be pounced on and you're caught. Ow, so you've been with snakes. Yeah. And they're no good. And you, and you keep ending up with the same kind of guy. Pretty much so. Mm -hmm. Scott, what has your history been relationship-wise? Uh, married nine years and three kids. Uh, I just kind of rocky relationship where the, uh, constantly yelling and screaming and uh, seeking uh, uh, therapy and different ways to keep the the friction from uh, coming too strong. Now, do you do you have other brothers and sisters? We're uh, from a family of six kids. Ooh, have they had a similar history? You might say that to varying degrees. Do you think it might be the relationship that your mom and dad had? I would put it that way. What was your dad like, Kelly? Well, um, I used to call him Grizzly Adams. In that, in that friendly, huggable, rough guy way, or Well, you might else? see him that way um, in a, like a frontal view of him. You'd see him that way, but when you got to know him, he was like a grizzly. The growly. Uh -huh. uh, Scott, did you see him the same way? Oh yeah, his appearance is that way, and and uh, whereas uh, the Grizzly Adams was a real friendly guy, my dad's kind of friendly and everything. He, he just puts on a uh, uh, makes everybody nervous. Like uh, had a bunch of friends over, and and he pulled up, and they all scattered. Hey, your dad's here, gotta go, see you later. It's like, you know, well, it's just my dad, ain't no big deal. 
Did your mom and dad communicate throughout their marriage? Do they now? I'd say they communicate a lot better now. Um, and it's partly due to the fact that my mother smartened up quite a bit, I think. Um, I watched the changes in her, so I know that it had to do a lot with how she handled the relationship. Did she read John's book? No, but she will. <laughs> she should. John, w what do you think about what you're hearing? Well, there's two elements to what we're hearing. One thing we're hearing is that you're, in certain ways you didn't learn in a positive way how to have relationships. Certainly if people run from your father, you don't have a positive role model of how to have good relationships. But another element, which is universal, is that the rules and the skills that our parents' generation had to make their relationships work don't work today. Even if your parents have a great relationship in their generation, there are models. And if we follow what they did, it's not going to work today. The old model used to be that a man was successful in his marriage if he was a good provider. If he got up early and went to work and came home every night, what more can you expect? I mean, that was it. You shouldn't, you know, complain. In my mother's generation, for example, she didn't complain my dad wasn't a good communicator. He's a good provider. But today, women are providers too. They're bringing in the money as well. They're doing what their fathers did and what their mothers do. So their expectations, their standards, their needs have changed in relationship. The whole climate today and all of the media and everything we see is a different set of priorities. It used to be survival of the family unit was the priority. Today, what is the new priority? The new priority is emotional fulfillment. We look to each other for romance, for love, for someone to be there for us. We get home to recover from the stress of the day, to have companionship, and to enjoy our lives more. My mother could settle for a husband who didn't know all these romantic skills because he was a good provider. But today, that is not enough. And so what happens is when women, particularly when women, are out doing what their fathers did, they're having to be like men to a certain extent. And when they come home, they want to be women. And the way they connect best with being feminine is through talking, sharing, communicating. And we men have never learned how to do this. See, men never had to do this to make women happy. We don't know how to do it the way women want us to do it. You know, a woman would say, what are you feeling? Nothing. <laughs> and she goes, well, don't you love me anymore? Don't you want to talk to me? And for a man, talking and sharing isn't necessarily a sign that I love you. Me going and doing something, risking my life or working hard, that's the way I show my love, not by through talking. Whereas when a man doesn't want to talk, women will tend to take it personally. And sometimes they'll, they'll say, they'll start asking questions to get him to talk. He feels annoyed. Then when she's talking about her day, he starts solving her problems, which annoys her. She just wants somebody to listen and go, yeah, that was an awful day. Sounds terrible. Instead, he's saying stuff like, quit that job. Get rid of it. Kelly, That's not what she wants to hear. Well, we're going to come back, uh, and we're going to meet Scott and Kelly's mom. When we come back, don't go away. Yeah! Hey, if you're not here, you're missing out. Come join our studio audience. We want you on the pageant show. Call our hotline at 415-522-9622. Want to know how KPIX is making broadcasting better for you? We're combining the news teams of KPIX 5 and 95.7 KPIX FM into one new service. You'll get two top meteorologists, 24 hour traffic, and the kind of KPIX reporting you count on. Where's the best place to get news, weather, and traffic? All on the FM dial? Your FM source for news and information, 95.7 KPIX. Wake up. Call 976-WAKE. Get out of bed and get ahead. Use your touch-tone phone. Call 976-WAKE. We're the wake-up that works. So why worry? Don't ever be late again. Call 976-WAKE. Do it now. Only $2 plus possible toll. Depend on us. Call 976-WAKE and wake up right. Wake up bright. Wake up to us tomorrow. For service outside California, call 1-900-976-WAKE. Imagine closing your eyes and not being able to open them for 20 years. Imagine what you'd miss. 20 Christmases, your daughter's wedding, the dawn of a new millennium, the birth of your grandson, your father's death. 
Now imagine opening your eyes and seeing your granddaughter for the first time ever. This is what surgical eye expeditions can do for blind people with your help. Over 80% of world blindness is easily correctable. Call 1-800-20-2C. coming back with us before we went away we met scott and kelly who say they learned how to have their relationships from their parents um doctor i wanted to ask you is it fair to to blame our parents our plan we should always remember our parents did the best they could any parent will say i did the best i could and particularly today the emotional climate that we live in with women working and men working and hardly having times for the relationship there's so many new stresses and so many new problems that confront our parents were not given the skills to pass on to us to have better relationships. We tend to say, well, they didn't teach me this, or I didn't know how to do this, or they could have done better. They did the best they could do. And in that generation, and for many generations before, that was good parenting. But this has changed. It's a radically different time today. And if we want our relationships between each other to work, the place to start, if we do have blame for our parents, is to forgive them. Because forgiveness is the essence of any relationship. No matter how perfect you are for each other, there's going to be problems, and you have to forgive and work together. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. This is Kelly and Scott's mom, Fran. Um, this is tricky. I just ended that last part with, can, you know, what about blaming your parents when you're the mom? What do you think about that? Well, I don't blame my parents, or I try not to, and I would hope that the next generation wouldn't blame us. We did do the best that we could. Uh, as far as what Scott was saying about his dad, it was very true. He was not able to demonstrate physical affection. I don't think he ever told his kids, I love you. But they knew that he did care about the family unit. He never said he loved you? Never, Never did. Mm -mm. Never. See, this sounds like a terrible thing in this generation. But in previous generations, fathers didn't tell their children, I love you. And a quick story, when I started learning about emotional self-esteem and development and therapy, I went to my dad and said to my dad, Dad, you've never told me you love me. And he says, he was very honest, he says, well, don't you know I love you? All that I've done? I said, of course I know you love me, Dad, but I'd like to hear you say, I love you, John. And he said, that's uncomfortable for me to say, because in my generation, you tell somebody you love them when you want to have sex with them. Mm -hmm. See, love and sex were tied together. So it was very in inappropriate for a man to say, I love you, if it's tied to sex. And for men, it is very much tied together, because when men are sexually aroused, they feel the most loving. That's the thing about men. That's how men open their heart. You know, that's when they feel the most, either when they're watching a football game or they're having sex. Okay. I do have to give the... <laughs> <laughs> I want to say one other thing before I finish this. Yeah. Uh, my dad did then. He said, but if it's important to you, I'll say the words. So he said, it just, I have to adjust to this modern time. I said, that's right, Dad. Just say the words. They're, I love you, John. And there was this long pause. It was like he didn't have the neural connectors in his brain to do it. <laughs> but he said it, I love you, John. I said, thanks, Dad, that's great. And from that moment on, every time I talked to him on the phone afterwards, he'd say, I love you, John. And then towards the end, he'd say, and I'm so proud of you. And those are things fathers today have to realize for their boys and their girls, how important they are. And it never goes away how old your children are. I love you and I'm proud of you are such important messages. <laughs> How do, you, how do you feel about that? Do you, do you tell your children oh, yeah. that you love them? Every day. And you're proud of them? Yeah. Did you know that you missed that? That you wished you'd had that? Or? Yeah, but, you know, like you said, I seen what my dad did for the family and the, the unit and everything, and it was, it was quite a bit. He did a, an awful lot. You know what Scott does to his dad? When he sees his dad, he'll <laughs> say, see you later, dad, and I love you, dad. And his father goes, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he just doesn't know what to do with it. It's is just it a hard... okay? Good? Is okay? I love you to you? Oh, I mean, yeah. Have you ever said, Dad, can you just once say? Oh, I never asked him to say it. I just, I'd harass him about it once in a while. But, but you tell you know, your children I, all the time I, you love them. I'm more open to them than a lot of people are, because a lot of people won't tell them how they feel. You know, they feel intimidated by them, and it doesn't bother me. 
See, this is another problem in relationships today. Us sons, we grow up, we see our fathers not expressing love through speech. Because traditionally, they express it through risking their lives, standing guard, going to war. You knew he loved you, so he feels, why do I have to say it? But today, women are out there at war. Women are out there protecting themselves. And when women come home, they need to hear it. So what I tell men to do, wake up in the morning and practice saying in the mirror, I love you, honey, I love you, to where you got those neural connectors where you can say it to your partner. Two to three times a day, if you're married, say that to your partner. But it takes practice. It's not a natural thing for a man to feel his love and talk about it. Let's and just this try is that once. Could all the men in the audience just look straight at me and say, I love you, honey. <laughs> One, two, three. I love you, honey. Thank you. We did it. All right. Hey, they're good. How was your relationship with him as a husband? Um, we've been married 42 years. And the first 30 were pretty rough. Because... The first 30. <laughs> um, pretty much single-handedly, I took care of the six kids. And started to go to college when the sixth uh, child was two years old and took 13 years but made it through college. PTA mother, PTA president, all these yeah, things. All the positive feedback from our mother. You know, the positive feedback that helps our self-esteem grow, makes us feel good and confident as a person, get out there in the world and make it happen. It all came from her. We got none of it from our father. We, the reaction we got from our dad when we approached him was, you're in my space, you know, get out of my space. Like, you're in my chair. Yeah. Gee, I love you too, Dad. You know, that kind of thing. His theory was keep the wife barefoot and pregnant. And if you want, if you, if you can't afford slaves, have children. Oh. <laughs> but that's <laughs> more than we even look at that. We don't want to be too uh, critical of this philosophy. This that's was how survival also, used to be ensured. This was teasing, too, some, somewhat teasing. I got to talk to Sarah Jessica Parker. This might sound light, but it's actually, she's got a movie out now called Miami Rhapsody that deals with this subject. It's great. You should see it. We'll be right back. Come back. It's about a young woman who, at the beginning of the film, she she is uh, she's go been going out with this this nice fellow for uh, for a while now, and then he asks her to marry him, and she, of course, is very flattered and says yes, and then through the course of the movie, discovers that every one of her family members, all of whom are married, are having extramarital affairs. I don't want to live together. I want to get married. Really, you don't you don't see it as a dying institution? No, I still think marriage works. My parents had a wonderful marriage. Yeah, well, please, your parents were saints. They could they could probably cure leprosy too. Okay, you just got this idea in your head that the marriage leads to misery. Well, it's true. Married women get depressed more than single women. Because they marry the wrong people. Well, how can you be so positively sure that we're the right people? I mean, look at these two. Third time's a charm. Please, who's who's to say that that's not going to be us one day? Patch it. What does the color of your skin have to do with your heart? I get, oh my God, what is she doing with that black person? And people stare. Us black people, we got to stay together, man. What's going on? What do you think? Is love blind? On the next pageant. When I needed an attorney for my divorce and child custody matter, most attorneys required enormous fees in advance. Finally, several people recommended me to a firm that handled only family law cases. At the Ritzinger Law Firm, my first visit was free, and they accepted my case with no money down and a payment plan I could afford. My attorneys were experienced, aggressive, and responded to my constant needs. I now have custody of my daughter and the financial support to start my life over. Call the Ritzinger Law Firm for a free immediate consultation. 1-800-222-0205. Pay the lowest price possible by buying Factory Direct from San Francisco's highest volume discount jeweler. The jewelry exchange in Burlingame is the region's leading direct diamond importer and manufacturer of Trillion, Marquee, Princess Cut, Baguette, and Invisible Mountings. One carat diamond pendants are one ninety nine. One carat diamond earrings three ninety nine. Four carat diamond tennis bracelets eight ninety nine. The jewelry exchange guarantees its jewelry to appraise for twice the purchase price. The jewelry exchange in Burlingame four one five five seven nine forty seven hundred five seven nine forty seven hundred. Who can tell me what seven times two is? One in twenty children has attention deficit disorder, or ADD. If your child is one of them, he or she may be calling for help, not with words, but with actions. The mind of a child with ADD is like a television with the channels constantly changing. His thoughts and actions change quickly. I cannot do this. I can't. Now, we go through this every night. Look at the problem and focus, sweetie, please. I'm trying. I'm trying my best. Now, quit.
quit bugging me, Brian. Everyday tasks like paying attention or following instructions are extremely difficult. Try as they might, the people who care about him often don't understand him. And the child may be left feeling like a failure. If you suspect your son or daughter might have attention deficit disorder, you can help. Dial 1-800-233-4050 and answer your child's call for help today. Very good, Brian. Thank you for helping me. Um, you know, I think we'd all like to blame our parents for something. <laughs> you know, for any flaws we have, they think can all be attributed to parent, to bad parental skills. I think you definitely learn about role playing, like from your parents and things like that. But I think a lot of us feel like, you know, we're passive because we saw our mothers be passive in relationships, or, mm -hmm. or we we tend to defer to the man because that's the image that we grew up with, or that's the image we feel is more feminine, you know, not. You know, Parker talking about relationships. Me and like Sarah Jessica Parker are like this now. She said I can hang out with her and Matthew Broderick all the time. But we have a real live couple on our stage now. Please welcome Roseanne and Chris. <laughs> Roseanne and Chris are in love. They are committed to each other. But they keep running into some pretty typical relationship traps. Uh, and we can maybe get some advice from my co-host, the doctor. So. Um, tell me what, what is so frustrating for you about your relationship. I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, well, Christmas, for example, biggest holiday of the year for a lot of people. And uh, I was excited about it. I wanted him to join my family and spend the day with us. So we talked about it before. We talked about it. I worked on him for about a week. I worked on him to say, all right, Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve, you're at your parents' house. Christmas Day, you're with my family. I told him, I called him the night before we were set. Called him the day of 9.30. Oh yeah, yeah, I'll be there, I'll be there. 11 o'clock, I keep saying, oh, he should be here any minute. I call him, uh, oh yeah, yeah, I'll be there, I'll be there. Uh, Three o'clock, he's still not there. Chris. My family's starting to think, you know, does she have this boyfriend or what? Where is he? I thought he was coming. About four, five o'clock, just in time for dinner, he arrives. What was the problem? A car accident? No. Car breakdown? No. He was playing with the computer. Ooh, oh, oh. There are two sides to every story. Chris, Chris, what happened? This is your lady fair, the woman you love and the family. It's a holiday. What happened? Uh, well, I, I got this uh, computer program for my dad this uh, Christmas, and... Ooh. Hey, <laughs> did it... Wait, we need to hear... We need to hear now, okay? And it sucked you into the monitor, and... <laughs> Over overwhelming force, yes. Uh, More attractive than me, my force, I presume. Well, oh, was so it a dirty but... computer program? No, it was... <laughs> <laughs> Luckily not. <laughs> So, does this happen often? He got busy, and to him it was important and overwhelming. This is a pattern. This is a pattern. Well, we my dad was excited about it, and I wanted to get it up and running and fig configured right, and uh, I couldn't do that. But this isn't the first time, and I'm sure it won't be the last. Is there anything well, Roseanne does that bothers you? Chris, did you think it would be a big deal if you arrived late? Did you, like, um, realize the time had passed and got all upset, or you'd realize well, let me just finish this program. I'll still get there in time for dinner. What was your thinking on that? Uh, or was I don't notice no time passing. When I'm focused in on something, it's, it <laughs> goes by like water. It's, um, see, this is very important. Cause see, this happens with mothers with their little boys, too. When little boys do things that mothers can't understand, they'll say to that little boy, what were you thinking? Why did you do that? And he wasn't thinking. See, guys aren't thinking all the time like women think all the time. Okay? <laughs> I wasn't implying no, that women they're... are more intelligent than guys. I was saying there's equal adults. Women are thinking more. But, but women do. They think about this. They think about that. I mean, I could be on the phone 
talking. My wife will ask me questions while I'm talking on the phone. And I said, I can't talk to you and this person at the same time. But she doesn't realize that because she can be on the phone, she can be cooking dinner, she can carry on a conversation with me, she can tell me what to eat, what not to eat, what the kids should eat, and what they're going to wear tomorrow for school. All at same once, time. okay? Have her on that cure for cancer thing while she's on the phone next time. <laughs> and I realized I had somewhere... I think that Chris is afraid of commitment and avoiding the family on Christmas is really um, exemplary of that. Chris? So it, that's family? making a commitment. When you, when you produce yourself in front of the family, you're making a commitment, in, mm -hmm. in a sense. What do you think? Um, yeah, I think it's a commitment. But then I also have a commi commitment to my own family, too. I, I see my parents. Hmm? Was with I family. was with my family. I wasn't at home configuring my own computer. I was at my father's uh, house mm -hmm. configuring his. Hey, it was Chris? his program that I... I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, the whole thing with guys, what women have to understand is when guys mess up, Women lots of times try to think there's some deep psychological reason for it. And that's not always the case. It's just the guy doesn't realize <laughs> that if he's going to be late for dinner to his girlfriend's Christmas family, this is a big event. You don't do it, okay? And you learn. Next year, would you forget to do it? Um, God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole thing. Well, well, I knew uh, I had somewhere to be, and I knew I had to be there at a specific time, but I just had one more thing to accomplish That's right. Before computers I... eat up time. Oh, if anybody's yeah. ever been on computers, you know they just eat it up. It's just like can be gone. I'm not making excuses. I'm just explaining this guy's not giving us a job like to, to you know, it's not a fear of commitment or phobia of this, or there's not some hidden getting even with his wife thing or anything. It's just he was on the computer. He stopped thinking about his relationship. And this is hard for women to understand because women never stop thinking about everything. They can't just sort of zone in and forget everything. They think about everything. And this is, has huge consequences in a relationship because men will tend to forget things that women wouldn't forget. So you get women saying all the time, oh, men, they forget this, they forget this. And then they think, he doesn't love me because if I was in a relationship and cared about somebody, I wouldn't forget those things. But I'll tell you, women, you also forget things. What you forget sometimes is how wonderful this guy is when he forgets things. Okay, so women also can lose their memory. And men, when that happens, what we have to remember is just let her talk about it, understand she has a right to be upset about it, a right to say, this is a big mistake, and I'm upset about it, I'm embarrassed about it, I'm humiliated, and, and you let her talk about it. Then after you listen and you don't argue with her, she'll remember what a great guy you are and forgive you. And that's the secret. If you want women to forgive your mistakes, Give them what they need. You're agreeing with everything he's saying. Um, yeah. I, I am. Yeah, actually, it, it seems like the computer thing is definitely the truth. I mean, it's not... Uh, other things, as far as commitment-wise, are going very well. We're, we're happy. But uh, when it's computers or tasks, something... If he's doing a job, he will see that job to fruition. Focus. Or, tunnel vision. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's the king of tunnel vision. Yeah. <laughs> he, I think he has no peripheral vision. I really do. We have uh, a question. I have a question for Dr. Gray. You said that... Thinking constantly, women think constantly, is that, you're saying that that's a feminine quality or? It's a physiological trait that women have in their brains that we don't have. They have found, <laughs> well, I'll put that, this is proof. It? On it, UCLA, they've done brain studies on the differences between men and women's brains. And there are lots of differences between the brains and they don't exactly know what the differences mean. But one big concrete difference is how we use our brains. Women will tend to use both parts of the brain simultaneously and many parts of the brain simultaneously. Men use one part at a time. So hence, we're like focused over here. We can't remember what's over there. We go over that? here, we go over here. So there's agree? a greater sense of focus. Now you may be an exception to that. Left-handed men will tend to have more connective tissue between the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Very creative men will tend to have more connective tissue between left and right hemispheres of the brain. But most men, tend to use one part of the brain at a time, and so they have this tunnel vision thing that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have another I... question. I think that this is a really complex issue, and that the thing about the brain is that science has shown that we know virtually nothing about brain function. I agree with you. And what you're talking about is actually about socialization, and it's not about brain function. And that I think that what we're talking about here is somebody who just forgot Yes. And he may not be a great guy. And every guy who forgets something <laughs> is not just a great guy. Oh. <laughs> well, what are you going to say about that? Chris, let, it, let him Chris. explain it. Do he was going to say something. Go ahead. Do you have, do you have, you have problems with Roseanne? Uh, no. Oh, oh, well. Do you have problems with <laughs> no, We'll be right back with some questions from single people in our audience.
your guy a mama's boy? Have you had it being second in line? If so, give us a call. We want to hear your story. Call us at 415-522-9633. a story like this, there's a lot to wonder. How could one person commit both murders? Why would the police want to frame him? How does DNA really work? Why did he run? Throughout the trial, turn to 95.7 KPIX FM for live courtroom coverage. Then, weeknights at 10.30, KPIX 5 News will analyze the events each day in the O.J. Simpson murder case. You have questions, KPIX Radio and TV have answers. Wake up. Call 976-WAKE. Get out of bed and get ahead. Use your touch-tone phone. Call 976-WAKE. We're the wake-up that works. So why worry? Don't ever be late again. Call 976-WAKE. Do it now. Only $2 plus possible toll. Depend on us. Call 976-WAKE and wake up right. Wake up bright. Wake up to us tomorrow. For service outside California, call 1-900-976-WAKE. I don't know, I'm missing something there. This is New Guinea. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful. I don't see it. I'm having an out-of-decade experience. <laughs> I was walking and came upon a fountain which bore the sign, Don't Drink the Water. Do you get beggar this? Carries a Isn't sign it fantastic? What does this poem mean to me? It's like a collage of images. Let's face it, not every cultural activity appeals to everyone. Finding an oasis. So we're giving you something everyone likes. A choice. That's why 23,000 arts and humanities groups are inviting you to find something you can get excited about. Just call for a free brochure about what's going on in your community. I think I'm getting into this. They're tuning up. The Arts and Humanities. There is something in it for you. California has Arts and Humanities for everyone. Call the 800 number to learn more. Hey, we're back. We are talking about relationships. I wanted to go to Kelly. We've heard Roseanne and Chris talk about the, well, Roseanne has a problem with Chris. Chris is fine. Roseanne. <laughs> Kelly, what were the problems in your marriage? Marriage one. Marriage one. Or with um, all the men in your life. All the men in my life. They were all the same problems. They all Each had the time. same problem. It was like a lack of social skills. They couldn't communicate or in the, you know, like the first date or two, it would be there, be, you know, like a live wire there with you. And then all of a sudden it would be gone. It's like, who was I talking to in the first place? <laughs> they just, they don't respond the way you thought they would respond or it just would disappear. This is such a common frustration that women experience today. They look at the men they're in relationship with and they go, what's wrong with this guy? Then they find another one and then they think, due to some mysterious pattern from childhood, I attract men with psychological problems. It's not that. Men haven't been taught the skills that women need to feel good communication, the skills that women need in order to feel intimate with a man. The skills men used to learn that was enough for women was let me do a good job, let me be a good provider, let me not get upset with her when she's in a bad mood, and just sort of listen. And that's all men were taught to do. They weren't taught how to interact with a woman when she wants to talk, when she wants to share. Women used to spend most of the day talking with other women. And now they don't have that opportunity. They come home and they want him to somehow know how to create a conversation. And we kind of go, why does she want to talk so much? We can't figure it out because that's not what brings us the, the amount of stress reduction we need. For a man, better than a conversation is watch, watch his favorite football game. See, a football game lets a guy get in touch with his feelings. Filling around the computer lets him get in touch with struggling with pro solving problems that really don't matter. That's how men can forget. Well, well. <laughs> that's how men can forget the problems that do matter. You see, part of coming home is forgetting the problems at work. Men do it by some little activity, whereas women do it by remembering the problems at work and talking about it. So men don't understand it, and women don't understand him. Do you guys agree with what he's saying or disagree? Oh! What did you want to say? Well, I have two things to say. Um, one, I'm, I have to say something to the doctor. My husband, every day, tells me he loves me. That's I mean, good. every day, I mean, every day, just every day, every time he can, he tells me he loves me. Right so on. Here. Second, second I of do all, with I my wife as well. <laughs> Second of all, I want to know what the the problem, what 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 are all your problems with the, ch the what are the effects on your with the children? What exactly are the effects with the children with your relationships? You mean and because they got 
with your getting divorces, divorces and, and everything. Do you think it's better to get divorced and face the problem than stay together in and perpetuate case, it? In my case, it was definitely. It was better for my son not to see us together interacting in the very negative way that we did. It was very abusive, both physically and verbal. So he didn't get any good role models from us. I knew that right away when he was less than two. I was thinking about that while he was <clears throat> getting older and he was starting to communicate. When children start to communicate, they start to retain things more. Yeah. I knew it was going to be set in him, the same kind of patterns if I stuck around. Was your father abusive? Mental, er, mentally. <laughs> Verbally? Uh, yeah, he would call us monsters and rats and... You know, I think what's important to, to you know, dad's out there somewhere and in the standards of his civilization that he lived in, these kinds of behaviors weren't labeled as abusive. I grew up in Texas where you spank kids, you whipped them with a belt, that wasn't considered abusive. You went to school, if you misbehaved, you got whipped with a paddle. They pull your yeah. pants down and hit you with a paddle Who and you have welts. Spanked. I was spanked. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. And now... You got spanked a little too much, sir, I think. You liked it. <laughs> did you... Stand up. Did you, did you agree with what, what uh, Dr. Gray was saying before? No. No, no. Can you give me a little more than that, sir? Yeah. Um, now, it's fine to tell someone you love them, but I believe in showing. Yes. And oh, tell them. But weren't you saying that's sort of the thing men thought everyone knew they loved them because that's they right. were doing? Yeah. Men instinctively say what he's saying, which I'm not uh, disagreeing with. Men want will act out their love, and they think that's enough. And today's modern woman will typically say, he never tells me he loves me, I want to hear it. Women want more communication today, much more than any other generation. And back with the paddling, spanking today is considered abusive, which was then in those days, it wasn't. Uh -huh, and? So that's why we have to see that standards have changed. <coughs> Our parents weren't uh, evil, awful <coughs> people. <coughs> All right, now. Let's get that belt out. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> but, but I believe that you have to let your spouse know how much you appreciate them. I agree, yay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Spend more quality time. If you say you love them, they should come first. And That's then right. whatever needs to be done. And if you forget, write it down. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. You're right. Uh, Chris, I was wondering, by any chance, do you not like Roseanne's parents? Is that uh, a no, reason? No, actually, I like their par her parents. Because uh, there comes a time, I'm only 16, so I know it's kind of odd to take it from me, but... Wait, do we have permission? Yes. Oh, okay. good. <laughs> <laughs> there kind of comes a time where you have to choose priorities. Um, you know, there's the computer, there's the time to be with her parents, to be with her. And especially on a holiday, I think your priority should be with her and with her family instead of installing a computer program, which you could do the following day after. Yes. 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 Here. And everything he said was wonderful. But what you have to understand about a man is that he already agreed that he realized it was a mistake and a blunder. And women will do this. They want to, like, really make sure a guy knows what he did was wrong and bring it up to him again and again. And what you have to know is when you keep bringing things up again and again, the chances of him remembering are less. Because when you bring it up to him, how many men can relate to what I'm talking about? They raise your hands or clap. Let the women hear that, you know. This is, you know. We, we're not stupid. This guy's not dunce. He heard all these people say he does not need anybody preaching to him, telling him what he did wrong again and again and again. And if you do that, negative messages tend to go into a repression. We tend to just forget. If it's too negative, we just want to push it away. What men remember is positive messages. Like that man saying, we want to be appreciated. Find the things he does right. And just say, remember last Christmas when you finally did come over? That was so wonderful. <laughs> wait, wait. Did you do I have that a, earlier in the day? I have a positive message. See, this is a symbol for we gotta go. We're gonna go from relationship hell to relationship heaven. Talking about sex. When we come back. I would like to believe marriage can work, and I also am very old fashioned in that I think people should be married once and it's not some sort of passing fancy. Sometimes there's magic in a melody. Even without words, certain music...
1-800-437-2200. That's 1-800-437-2200. Or send 1995 for three cassettes or 2495 for two compact discs. Plus $4 shipping to Instrumental Gold, PO Box 7800, Department R, Libertyville, Illinois, 60048. You're upset. Somehow I thought you'd be more understanding. Well, I'll try. You know, I'm gonna... I'll try, but it's, it's a little disturbing to learn that both your parents are committing adultery. You know, it's not the norm. We're not from L.A. Jessica Parker starring in the film Miami Rhapsody that should be out like today, I think. Uh, and I wanted to come to Chris. You wanted some. You wanted to say something about that last question before we went away. Uh, yes, it, it seems like he. Um, you're 16 years old. Well, it really hurts when a 16 year old tells me that I got my priorities screwed up. And, <laughs> um, but uh, what I don't think you understand is that uh, most of my priorities are already set for me, usually by this person. <laughs> and every weekend it's. It, she's got a whole book. She's she's a prioritizer and organizer, and I really like, you know, respect her for that because I can't do it myself. But uh, is that a problem? This might be for a problem you? here. <laughs> that she schedules everything. Well, it's not really a problem because uh, if she schedules something at the last minute, I can re usually rearrange my schedule and you know put off something that I wanted to do that I thought I would I dreamed about doing all week. And <laughs> Friday says we got to go somewhere. And okay, I can do that. Well, it sounds like something so, you dreamed yeah, flexible, about all week. So. And, but I'll go. <laughs> it doesn't bother you. Um. Not particularly. Maybe on a subconscious level. Maybe that's why there's a little time thing. No, they're so new in their relationship, it doesn't bother him. He's a wonderful man. He respects her point of view. She's different from him. She sees it as complimentary to him. She adds to his life. He tends to forget things. She remembers things. So it works out really nice. However, the danger, the red flag, is down the line. When they're married a few years, quite commonly, when she starts reminding of things all the time, men call that nagging. Okay? And that's the big thing. And Do you see like, that as happening, perhaps? Roseanne or Chris? In the car, uh, we have this really bad thing where we always say, if we ever have to take a trip across the country, we'll take two cars because that's exactly it. It's reminding him of things. It's, it's you can't drive across the country together? No, there's no way we're going to drive across the country. Not. No, we're not. Going across town is a problem. Yeah. Wow. Because she tells you how to drive? Is exactly. that it? Well, he doesn't she's drive correctly. That's right. And he doesn't driving. drive correctly. <laughs> See, this is where all the arguments start sometimes in the car, in the car. when the guy's driving and the uh -huh. woman's trying to tell him how to drive. I mean, it's a place where it's tense. We know men, better. One of the things about men, if you talk to men, one of their big complaints about relationships with women, quite commonly, is the thing they hate is when women give unsolicited advice. Like, <laughs> turn here, slow uh -huh. down, or you'll get a ticket. Oh, really? I'll wow, get a ticket? Guys. Wow, yeah, of course the guys that. are going to clap at that. It's like women don't realize, you know, when two women are together and one of them says, slow down, there's a policeman. She goes, oh, thanks. But you say to a guy, slow down, there's a policeman. I, I can saw. slow down. I can uh, do that. I, I don't need that. you to tell me. <laughs> so I knew. It's a sensitive area. Men and women have different sensitivities. We just have to respect them. For example, woman's sensitivity that men don't realize. We walk all over. And she might be upset about something and a guy will say, ah, oh, don't worry about that. See, she, what do you mean, don't worry about that? This is a big deal, you know, that's right. You know, whereas another guy says to another guy, don't worry about it, and he goes, yeah, don't worry about it, let's play game, okay? You know, it's, it's not an insult. So there's certain things that we don't realize we're walking over the sensitivities of the opposite sex. Okay, okay. we have a question. Oh. Okay, my question is, uh, he touched on it a little bit. I wanted to know a little bit more of the problems on the end, the couple on the end here. Um, okay. That was one example, the Christmas. But um, you said there were other things that he forgets or, or things that might hurt you personally. I just wanted to know what they were and uh, when do you call it quits? When do you say, okay, this is enough that... Uh he, he does forget about me all the time. Christmas is a big thing for me. Right. Okay. Well, it's just it's a time thing. Like he said, I'm a hyper scheduler. And so time, if we're going to be somewhere at 7, we're going to be somewhere at 7 in my book. Chris's book doesn't really have a clock. So uh, we might be there at 7, he might be there at 7.15, he might be there at 6. <laughs> <laughs> His time is much different than mine. Go but ahead. see, this is so common for sexual attraction to happen when people have opposite qualities. See, that's the whole thing. And love helps us to work out these opposite things. You could be a little bit less punctual, he could be more punctual. And as you learn to forgive each other and work together, you'll be better people as a Did result of it. Did you say sexual attraction? Yes, I said sexual attraction because you want to talk about, about sex. <laughs> sex is better if you're with an opposite. Absolutely. It's a, that's the only time you have it. You're not going to have sex with yourself. If somebody's just like you, you're not turned on to them. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> Go ahead. My, my question is actually for the doctor, and it has to do with the whole thing I thought was based on, you know, how your parents kind of screw up your relationships. And the whole thing is, like, I'm coming from a divorced family. I've never had two parents in my house my entire life. And my family, it's just like, I would get punished for something I didn't do, but then be told I was, you know, my parents were proud of me, but then get in trouble in the same breath. And it's like, what does that do to someone's self-esteem? And if, if someone doesn't have the self-esteem, how are they supposed to be successful in a relationship? It's very hard. You've got two things, the lack of support you might have received in childhood, but the other thing, which is even more important, instead of being victims of childhood, is as adults, we are adults, we can be free from the influence of the past to a much greater degree than we believe if we learn a new way of doing things. It's just we don't have classes, we don't have education that teaches us what our parents should have taught us if they could have. Our parents just couldn't teach us the things we need to, to learn today to have successful relationships. Why? Because in their generation, relationship skills were not primary. It was survival skills that was primary. Today, we want relationship skills. We want good quality, loving, intimate, supportive oh, wow. relationships that support our esteem, our self-esteem. How do we do that? We just learn new skills. We don't have to feel victims of our past for the rest of our lives. There's a way out of it. How about, uh, did your parents everyone on the stage teach you about the birds and the bees did they sit you down and say this is how it works no uh, yeah <laughs> well where'd you learn it all in the locker room locker room <laughs> ladies Friend. in the locker room bathroom Friend. bathroom <laughs> from it's our bathroom sister. Talk. <laughs> you had a question okay this mainly goes to uh, Kelly and her brother here I hear you guys uh, pointing blame at people other than in your relationship but what I'm not getting from you guys is that you're not looking at yourself and you're not telling us maybe what your parents, what tools your parents didn't give you to uh, apply to a relationship that you feel that you're lacking. And what are you going to do to change that if you do recognize that? Well, one of the things I noticed about myself was I wasn't standing up for myself as much as I should. I didn't realize that I had opinions that counted. Yeah. I didn't realize I was smart enough or good enough. And I think mostly in the last seven years when I started going through therapy, I've been through a lot of therapy, both uh, individual and a group, and I've read a lot of books. I have a library, you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. And I think that has mostly helped me to see the signs of things I might be stumbling into that could put me back in the cycle again if I didn't know that they were there, if I weren't aware of them. Yeah. Now I'm aware of them, and I get myself to stop and think before I make the wrong moves again. So it's mostly finding my strengths and my weaknesses and allowing for both in w when I'm interacting with people, both friends and men and work, family. How does this affect our sex lives? If your self-esteem is low, if you don't feel safe to be yourself, over time the chemistry won't work anymore. Particularly what women need and what men need for a good sex life tend to be different. A woman needs to feel that her feelings, her ideas, her thoughts, her wishes, her, her inner world are honored by the man. When she feels safe and respected, that she can express her feelings, that she'll be heard, passion can stay in a relationship. Ladies? Is that true? Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I would. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Women, for men, what men need to feel in a relationship with a woman to keep their passion alive, men need to feel that I make her happy. See, in sex, what is a man doing? Making a woman very happy. To get to sex, a man needs to feel in the relationship that I make her happy or I can make this woman happy. When you interview you emotionally men... emotionally happy or sexually happy? Oh. Happy, okay? <laughs> happy, okay? So what, tur what turns a man on to a woman is the potential to make her happy. If in the relationship he repeatedly experiences that what I do doesn't make her happy, then he's not going to be sexually attracted to her. You see, what men say when they're not attracted to a woman and they're ready to leave the relationship is I give and I give, I do everything I know, and no matter what I do, it's not enough to make her happy. Okay? Women don't say that when they leave a man. They say, I give and I give, I get nothing back, I have nothing left to give, I'm exhausted, I'm empty. Okay? So it's a very big difference of what women and men will say. Men just want the woman to be happy. And when communication doesn't work and the man doesn't see that he can make her happy, then he gets the message, I can't make her happy. And so this part of the body goes, maybe I can make her happy and yeah. stops being turned on to her. We are going to come back with Dr. John Gray's secrets to keeping passion alive. Ooh. <laughs> Every
every single sober day. I'm to hear Dr. John Gray's secrets for lasting passion. Get your pen and a piece of paper and write this down, okay? Uh, uh, how did you come up with these? Oh, through helping couples find passion and keeping it in my own marriage as well. You are a passion man. I'm a passion man. Right. <laughs> so we have, we have good communication. There's number one. Good communication is number one. Now, first of all, let's just remember that no time in history has passion, romantic passion, been a part of marriage. It was never expected to last. This is a thing of the 80s and 90s, this idea that we can have lasting romance and passion in a marriage. No culture, no part of history has ever recorded this as a, as a reality. But it can happen. If we communicate. If we use new skills. New skills for communication where the man, through, primarily through asking questions and listening, draws the woman out to express her feelings in the relationship where a woman feels safe to express her feelings. She feels he hears her, empathizes with her, supports her, and in her communication, she's able to repeatedly let him know he makes a difference in her life. Okay. That's good communication. Number two, romantic skills. Once you have good communication where the woman feels he cares and the man feels appreciated, then the man has to go back and do the things he did when he was dating. They're little things like planning a date instead of just leaving it to her, bringing flowers instead of just doing it once, being affectionate with her instead of stop being affectionate now that you're having sex. Most guys stop being affectionate once you're having sex, okay? Whereas women go, what happened to the affection? Where's all the touching? Where's all the attention? Where's all the compliments? We have to go back to the things that are easy. Oh, wait, Romantic skills. One. Sorry, three, sharing responsibilities, partnership. Once you get those communication and romantic skills, then the man starts doing more around the home. Doing dishes is great foreplay for great sex. If okay. you have a good relationship. Do the dishes and have good nookie. We'll be right back. <laughs> Wake up. Call 976-WAKE. Get out of bed and get ahead. Use your touch-tone phone. Call 976-W-A-K-E. We're the wake up that works. So why worry? Don't ever be late again. Call job application, read traffic signs, and vote. Reading is power. Call us at the National Literacy Hotline, 1-800-228-8813, for a program near you. Hey, it's Paget. Buy the book. What your mother couldn't tell you and your father didn't know by Dr. John Gray, I would like to thank all my guests and my fabulous audience. And uh, watch the show again. It only gets better from here. We've only just begun. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye the book. Bye the book. I have the key. This key takes us to the celebrity floor. We are never going to get this chance again, people. We're going to take Oh, did you see that? Look at how booming she's so booming. And she's really smart and funny, too. Let's go kick her ass. Paget's first celebrity interview. An emergency. 911. So my mom um, collects these. Nice to meet you. How are you doing? Study what acting? Oh, yeah. No, you never did. No, oh, but that's because wow. I was working. That's because I was really little. So, well, what? T t how did you even start doing that? Uh, by accident. By accident? What do you mean? In Cincinnati, mean? there was an audition for something. I don't know why I auditioned, but I did, and I got part. You don't remember how, how old were you? Though you were like three. I was eight. <laughs> for eight. Yeah. And you don't even remember how you got there? Would you take well, the bus? Well, there's the paper. <laughs> you, like, just hailed a cab. I'm going to be a star. <laughs> Patch it.
Pay the lowest price possible by buying fast.